Hello everyone and welcome in another session of AGC webinars. My name is Susanna Yeti and I'm the AGC Portfolio Marketing Manager and your host today. Today's topic is Corporate Social Responsibility, Balancing the Risk and Rewards. In the next 30 minutes we will go through Corporate Social Responsibility and its preferences for a wider range of issues around the organization with new responsibilities, opportunities and risks. To tell us more about it, joining us Mr. Gary Sikic. Mr. Sikic is a principal with Logical Management Systems Corporation and he is active in executive education where he has developed and delivered courses in enterprise risk management, contingency planning and performance management analytics. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, feel free to write them in the question box in the right-hand control panel. Uh, now, please, Mr. Sikic, you may start the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, uh, depending on where you're at in the world. I am going to talk to you about corporate social responsibility, and I'll talk to you in terms of balancing the risks and rewards. So, to start the presentation, um, a little bit of my background and contact information. As uh, was said, I've been doing a lot of this work for a number of years and continue to work with organizations around the world to develop programs for a variety of issues that they face. Uh, so let's look at corporate social responsibility. And I'll t look at this in this context. It's sort of a, an issue that becomes a conundrum for companies. How do I balance the risks of establishing a program and then reap the benefits and rewards for actually producing something that's of value to uh, the, so the society at large, if you will. So corporate social responsibility can be broken down, in my perspective, into nine critical steps. And these are the steps that we'll talk about today. So we'll go through each one of these. I'll give you a brief overview, and then we can look at how this process begins to unfold for organizations. So the, the definition that's generally provided for corporate social responsibility is here. I've highlighted what I consider to be the what a key area of social responsibility in, in some respects for organizations. The bold achieving business success through managing responsibility towards stakeholders uh, is a, a key part of social responsibility. So how do we balance business success, being a successful bu business, but yet manage to address the needs of our stakeholders, not just shareholders, but those who have a vested interest in our organization in some way, shape, or form. So the, the look at this process is one that uh, is challenging for a lot of organizations because their direction has not been set per se, and they, they've looked at social responsibility as a mechanism whereby they donate to the symphony or they donate to you know, a baseball stadium, uh, and they think that that's been sufficient. Well, what happens is that we realize very quickly that there's more to social responsibility. So if we look at social responsibility from a corporation, from a organization standpoint, I break it into three levels. There is a strategic level. We have our corporate mission, vision, and values. How do those align with our corporate social responsibility. We have operational level, which is how do we achieve the goals of the organization. At the strategic level, we set strategy, goals, and objectives. At the operational level, we look to achieve those goals. How do we do that in conjunction with meeting corporate social responsibilities? And then at the tactical level, this is where we actually do the work to achieve the, the objectives. So very, very tightly knit. All three are, are intertwined, but all three have distinct responsibilities and uh, focus, if you will. So when we look at this first step to establish goals and objectives, most organizations have to realize that we need to focus on those goals and objectives and not just present on a basis that looks good. So the slide here said, uh, are you making things fit regardless of the consequences? Uh, the activity trap uh, 
a book that was written by George Odioran describes the activity trap fairly well. Uh, it, Management and the Activity Trap is the name of the book. The Bed of Procrustes was written by Nassim Taleb, and if you know uh, Procrustes, he was a, a, you know, a, a stretcher of bodies, if, if you will. So he made things fit. So he had a he had invite guests over and would treat them to dinner and then have them stay overnight. If they were too big, he'd cut their legs off to fit in the bed. If they were too small, they'd, he'd stretch them to fit in the bed. This is where corporate social responsibility has to have a distinct goal and objective so that they can actually meet these commitments that they make and do them in such a way that it is helpful to not only the corporation but to the society as a whole. So if we look at two statements from two experts, Peter Drucker, who says 90% of the information used in organizations is internally focused and only 10% is about the outside environment. He says that's exactly backwards. And for corporate social responsibility, if you think about it, if you only know 10% 10, 10 about your outside environment, how can you have a corporate social responsibility program that is going to succeed at any great length? And then the second statement uh, is by Admiral Mike Mullen, the 17th Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, saying, we're living in a world where we need to completely understand our environment and then look for anomalies, look for change, and focus on the change. Uh, it's a wonderful statement. The, the problem I have with the statement is that completely understanding the environment is almost impossible due to the complexity of the environment in which we live in. In terms of generally understanding the environment, we can only understand so much, and that's so much in terms of what's in front of us and how we interpret it and how our biases affect this. So looking for anomalies and change becomes a challenge in a lot of respects. And for corporate social responsibility, this is, is an area that I consider to be a risk area. How do I know what my environment is like and what do I do to address that environment? So. Six things that I look at with corporate social responsibility that w relate to establishing objectives and goals. First is to have a strategy. What is that we commit to? What are we committed to doing? Then a concept of operation. How do we fulfill these commitments? And then having a structure organizationally that serves the needs to actually fulfill the commitments we're making with our strategy. Managing our resources, human resources, facilities and equipment resources, um, and monetary resources. Uh, those are big tasks. And then we begin to look at core competencies, the skills we need from our organization. Is our organization socially aware? Do they understand what corporate social responsibility is? And then building pragmatic leadership. I mentioned three levels, tactical, operational, and strategic. At all three levels, we have to have this integrated pragmatic leadership to optimize authority, decision-making, workflow, and information sharing. So very, very critical to address those six issues to achieve corporate goals and objectives. If we begin to look at the changes that are going on in the business world as well as government worlds, we start to see that there are some big changes with regards to how organizations are operating. So the slide here shows you a, a circle that's a strategy that encompasses three other circles and then a diamond. The first circle that is encompassed is risk management. How do I manage the risks, the threats, the hazard vulnerabilities that my enterprise faces? The BC is business continuity. How do I keep my business in business when disruptive things happen? And then CI is competitive intelligence, which actually looks at a recognition of change in the operating environment. So it begins to start to look at what's going on in, in the world and where am I at regarding competition, etc. And those all begin to start to converge on this thing called corporate social responsibility, which essentially is our look at what can we do to be better corporate citizens. And the, these three areas, inclusive in the strategy area, become critical to achieving corporate social responsibility goals. So when we look at those things, you have to begin to then say, 
once we establish our objectives, we have to begin to understand complexity, the complexity of the world we de deal in. So I'll give you a simple example, and you can go to YouTube and look at these uh, two, the two videos that I cite here. But the book I Pencil, which was written in 1958, gives you a, fa a fairly good idea of how complicated it is to make a simple thing such as a pencil. And as it was in 1958, over 1 billion pencils a year are made. Now it's 2016, we have over 14 billion pencils a year made. It takes over a million people involved in the process to make a pencil. And yet no one, no one person can do all the steps. So there's a lot of, of information and a lot of challenges in this area. So when we look at that aspect, how do you relate the complexity of making a pencil to social responsibility? Well, we have a tendency to like things that are simplest, uh, simple. Simplicity is a key. So how do you make your corporate social responsibility program simple in a complex world? We like causes, but we generally have a tendency to have bias when it comes to causes. So we have to begin to look at a non-biased view. We like concrete reasons for doing things, regulations. Regulation says we have to do this, so therefore we do it. And then we like things that make sense even if that sense happens to be wrong. But making sense is critical to a corporate social responsibility program. So when, once we get those two steps, then we have to look at how business, how, how business operates, what we call a business continuity life cycle. And this is an area where companies, organizations, governments, etc., begin to start to deal with the day-to-day -day realities of trying to stay in business. So you have a variety of programs that are instituted by organizations, everything from crisis communications to emergency response to business recovery to crisis management to systems and information recovery. And the yellow block at the center shows you a typical uh, kind of path that goes on. Normal business operations, something happens, now we have to go into response mitigation in, uh, mode and then move to reentry, recovery, restoration, and then resumption of what I call the new normal business operations. And then finally back to a you know, new normal, which are, you're faced with in, in this area four transition points. First one is an activation of my plan and a reactive response and how do I control the chaos. Second is now I didn't plan for this but I have to deal with it, unplanned disruptions. These can get you into a, a continuous loop if you're not able to break out of the transition point number two which is moving to three saying this is what I planned for now I can deal with this and then transition point number four termination. All this affects your corporate social responsibility program. Because if you're saying you're, you're operating and you're going to do a safe environment operation and provide good services and something happens where there's a crisis that impacts the stakeholders, you suddenly now have violated your corporate social responsibility program. How do you recover from that? So it becomes a real issue. Some things to consider with corporate social responsibility in terms of public relations and communications st uh, strategies. You want to establish a public relations and communications strategies. What do we want to communicate? How do we want to communicate it? And what can we do to validate that we are actually fulfilling the commitments we've communicated? Establish a crisis communications team. Get public relations, communications, human resources, legal department, other departments involved in the corporate social responsibility process. Develop and implement a notification process so that you can actually put out information to the broader community, social media if you will. Identify, train, and exercise your spokespeople. Make sure they know what it is there to say and not to say and, and then how to, how to express this in terms that are understandable to a broad base of audiences. Develop response materials in advance. Plan for a variety of scenarios because of the nature of change in the business world and the nature of change um, just overall as the world is. And then develop standby statements tailored to fit the situation. So you have some ready-made statements that if something 
impacts your corporate responsibility program, you can actually address it fairly quickly and custom fit as you need to the situation. But it allows you to be responsive. So now then we move to the fourth step, which is what I call risk management integration, which is critical when you begin to look at corporate social responsibility. We make a lot of commitments. Therefore, we have a lot of risk exposure. When we look at this aspect, you can break it down into these areas. You have a tremendous amount of complexity. You have a number of touch points the organization has to what I'll call its value chain. Customers, suppliers, vendors, various stakeholders, interested parties, etc. You have to be responsive. And in order to be responsive, you have to have the ability to have responsiveness built into the, your organization. And obviously you have to deal with resource constraints because you're limited to the amount of resources that you have available. You know, that's monetary, people-wise, uh, talent-wise, etc. So in a lot of respects, what's happened is that corporations have kind of gone to this perspective on the right side of this slide that says, look, it's much easier to sell, to sell. look what I did for you. We donated to the symphony. We donated to you know, your soccer stadium, your baseball stadium. Look at the, oh, look what good work we've done. Versus, look what I avoided for you, which is we're operating safely and we've avoided environmental pollution. We've avoided a catastrophic event. Uh, very, very challenging in a lot of respects. So that people, perception-wise, need to be un, uh, understanding of how you're managing risk and what you're doing to incorporate that into social responsibility. So if we look at this in a, in a sort of simple but complex diagram, uh, you have corporate responsibility strategy. The first blue uh, bubble there is labeled transparent vulnerabilities. These are things that we just don't see because we're so used to dealing with them. We don't see them as vulnerabilities. But the fact is, what you want to achieve excuse me, what you want to achieve is on the straight blue line an ability to sustain a corporate responsibility program. Right? So there's a couple of ways to look at it because there's risk involved. You can take action on, the, on making a decision and doing something. That can be the right action. Or that action can be the wrong action. You can do no action, that could be the right action, or it could be the wrong action. So you've got to deal with this issue of how do we execute and what are the risks for action or not taking action. And then how do we look at getting away from what I'll call linear versus nonlinear thinking, addressing what we call distorted maps of real risks. What are the true risks we're facing? How do we identify outliers? What are the various variables? And then what are the consequences, positive and negative consequences, of corporate social responsibility in order to achieve sustainability? So these are big issues that you could go on for days talking about, but I'll stop here because it's a lot of information. So we realize that when we look at corporate social responsibility and we look at the world as it stands today, one, there's a lot of uncertainty. Two, we have more access to knowledge than we have had ever. And as a result of this access to knowledge, we find that the more not knowledge we have, the less certain we are about things. So what we know, the confirmed and factual, is relatively a small amount of information. What we think we know, unconfirmed and uncollaborated information, broadens our horizon. What we need to know, things I call intelligence, the answers, are a bigger bubble, but it causes us to have to do more research and validate more things. And that what we don't know, we have as speculative. And then the things we just don't know because we haven't discovered them yet are those things that are out in the future that someday we'll put a label on and say, well, this is what we know, but this is what we don't know about that. So more knowledge, more uncertainty, the effect on corporate social responsibility becomes larger because this presents a big risk issue with regards to perception and with regards to how you're going about achieving corporate social responsibility. So when we look at this, I'll, I'll tie it to corporate objectives and goals. You have a strategy. Your goal is to, as a company, uh, and for the most part, be profitable, to make money. 
How do I do that? Well, I increase revenues and I reduce costs. I have strategic initiatives that I put forward to gain you know, market share, etc. There are potential risks with those strategic initiatives. KRI, which is the farthest blocks on the right, is key risk indicators. What do I establish to identify key risks that are emerging as I move towards achieving my strategic initiatives. This all ties in with corporate social responsibility because every one of those initiatives has a social responsibility element to it, whether it's seen or unseen, whether it's visible or transparent, if you will. So these are some thought processes and considerations that have to be taken into account when we look at integrating risk and start to build corporate social responsibility program. We need also to then consider for corporate social responsibility what I call the non-aligned risks to the organization. And non-aligned risks are essentially the following perspective. You have emerging risks that we don't necessarily see or have control over. They have a velocity. Uh, if you look at risk velocity, it's a concept that a lot of organizations are beginning to, to look at, uh, unfortunately, a f very few of them have actually introduced it into their risk assessment. So if you look at the bottom bullet on the slide, it says 70% of finance executives agree that risk velocity is a core consideration. Only 11% have introduced it into their risk assessments. That's a kind of a critical issue. Now, what I've done is kind of outline what I see as so sort of the corporate uh, risk issues that affect social responsibility in a lot of respects. So, in the red, competition. Obviously, competition is the biggest threat to business today because competition puts business out of business faster than any kind of natural disaster. So, competition being, being critical in a lot of respects. Uh, because there's so much sovereign debt and so much concern over sovereign debt today, we have to look at that and address it in terms of social responsibility. How do we address our organization's survivability if the country that we're headquartered in or the countries we operate in suddenly default on their debt and their currency is devalued? Uh, what do we do about global workforce? You know, a lot of discussion about aging workforce. I look at it not only as aging workforce, but miseducated workforce. Not that they're not well educated, but that they're not educated for the needs that are coming up because the aging workforce is transitioning. Geopolitical issues. We see a world fraught with geopolitical stress that we have. You have infrastructure issues, aging infrastructure, the need for developing countries to develop bigger and better infrastructure, global marketplaces. Linkages are so critical in the marketplace today that an event happening around the world from where you're at has Im almost immediate impact on you. Uh, foreign sources of supplies, w whatever that may be, energy supplies, food supplies, etc. Uh, environmental impacts. How do we address these? What do we do about pollution? Are there alternatives? Uh, alternatives to foreign sources of supply, alternatives to technology, technology as it advances. How does it impact us? What changes are, are being made? How do the economies react? What is, what is going on from a social trend standpoint? We start to see these as being issues that you need to have your focus on but you don't. You have to realize that in many respects, you have little or no control, but they impact your social responsibility program. So then we need to look at our decision making. And I hate to tell you this, but we all make decisions and they're all flawed. And they're all flawed because we never have all the information and we can never make a perfect decision. So addressing flawed decision making is something that we need to be, to be looking at. So when we look at this, I look at the, the fact that because we ask the wrong questions precisely, we get the wrong answers precisely, and as a result, we create what I call false positives. So I deal with a lot of contingency issues for companies. We always do questions ask, oh, how well prepared are you to address this crisis or this emergency? Oh, we have a plan, we're, we're prepared. But the realities may be totally different. And they may be better prepared to do certain things, but really not prepared to do 
what needs to get done. So it's a matter of reducing uncertainty when you begin to look at decision making, eliminating bias out of the decision making process, and, rec and actually recognizing bias, and then taking all this wealth of media information from the various social medias, etc., and turning it into what I call intelligence, something that is hard and fast that you can confirm as a decisionable issue. Okay, so getting that information turned into intelligence. Now we have validation proof of concept, which is essentially taking the corporate social responsibility program and validating it, making the program uh, a viable, valid program so that we can actually make sure what we've committed to is actually working. And this gets us into looking at challenging our assumptions. So when we look at corporate social responsibility, we have to challenge the, the assumption that our current strategy is going to work. So it's kind of like this example of a soccer team finding that their strategy is no longer on an even field because the home team has been able to elevate the field in their favor. So we need to really look at our strategy and how that strategy works and how our strategy needs to be adaptable to current situations and changing situations. So then we have to look at this eighth step, which is to conceptualize, position, calibrate, what I call maximizing risk buffering, which is essentially looking at how do we manage information and then to get it into a cycle where we can collect it, collate it, analyze it, validate it, distribute it, control it, so that it can be utilized throughout the organization and that people within and external to the organization have an understanding of what we are actually presenting to them. So it's a challenge in a lot of respects to make this a way of doing visit business versus an adjunct to the business that we're doing. And the last step I'll talk about is to rethink kind of the current paradigms, if you will, which is really to begin to understand that this issue of volatility and disorder creates nonlinear effects. So as the slide here said, rigid thinking defaults to what is not seen is not there. And then what is not understood does not exist. So we have a challenge to change our thought processes, begin to understand that time and volatility, that time and volatility have a potential impact corporate social responsibility programs. So the more time, the more events, the more potential for disorder. And because of the way we are in the world today, there's a lot of what I'll call opacity. So we have complex systems, organizations, a lot of independent interdependencies that are very severe, if you will. So there are a lot of interdependencies that we are challenged with. How do we isolate a causal relationship in a complex system? Well, that's almost impossible. So we look at how do we deal with this situation of what I'll call absolutely vulnerable. We've seen a lot of change in terms of how organizations begin to address significant issues. But we have to understand that this is a, a, an issue of being able to be flexible and adaptable. And the challenge is not to get stuck into a rigid format thinking that this is going to work for every situation. So this ability to, to move your thinking forward with your social responsibility program. So I'll give you kind of as, as a closer 12 steps or 12 questions that you need to begin to look at and answer. Um, the original 12 steps were from a book by a gentleman by the name of Michael Cami, K-A-M-I. It was written in the 1970s, and it looked at more of the strategic perspective in developing strat strategy goals and objectives. What I've done is kind of converted these 12 into a look at what corporate social responsibility may want to begin to start to answer. So for instance, your first step should be where are we defining what is our external environment profile? What, what does the external environment look like? What are we operating in? Are the key factors in our external environment, how much can we control them? 
what interfaces do you have? Second step in conjunction, to develop an internal environment profile. Build detailed snapshots of your business activities as they are at present and how they affect corporate social responsibility. The third step would be to look at where do you want to go? Develop assumptions about the future external environment. Catalog influences. Begin to look at how your corporate social responsibility program fits into the context of your business operations. And that know your challenges and threats, the risks that you faced with regard to your program. The next step is develop a capabilities profile. And this is kind of critical in a lot of respects, to know and understand what are your strengths and where, where are your needs, what are your, where, do, to do what we call a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, to identify those and start building those into your business activities and your social responsibility program. Now, how are we doing in our key results and activities areas? Uh, the fifth step would be to look at where might we go, developing future internal environmental assumptions. So building the internal assumptions as to where the business is going or where the organization is going. Not to predict as much, but to do a look at assessing what the future might bring us. And to look at how adaptable the organization needs to be. And then how adaptable our corporate social responsibility program needs to do to be to address the future issues. Uh, where might we go? Where do we want to go? Six step, develop objectives. So we talk about developing objectives. Create a pyramid of objectives. Define your business, if you will. Set functional objectives and then match corporate social responsibility to those defined objectives. Now that all sounds good. It, when you begin to look at it. But the reality is in today's day and age, corporate strategy generally lasts a strategic plan for no more than about 90 days. So it used to be you would have a five-year plan, a one-year plan. Now it's a 90-day plan because things change so rapidly. Strategy has got to be a lot more flexible and it's got to adapt fairly quickly to all the things that are happening in the world. Your corporate social responsibility program needs to be as adaptable. So we need to be looking at how do we develop objectives that we can uh, actually monitor and evaluate and change rapidly, uh, yet still meet the responsibilities that we've set forth. Uh, what do we have to do? Where's the gaps in our program? Do you develop a gap profile? What are the effects of new external forces? What assumptions can we make about future changes to our business environment? Uh, what could we do? Opportunities and problems. How do we act to fill these gaps? You know, talent acquisition is a huge issue today because so many organizations find that the talent that they need is no longer out there in the in the uh, the world simply because people are not being educated in these areas or they're choosing not to be educated in these areas. So this is a challenge area. If I'll give you two examples. The nuclear industry is looking at roughly 60 percent of the nuclear engineers at retirement age without a lot of a big replacement pool to, to be, it, be there. And we depend on nuclear power for a lot of our energy needs. The petrochemical industry, in less than a few years, 80% of the petrochemical engineers will be eligible to retire. So this produces a huge gap because you're not getting a lot of petrochemical engineers coming into the workplace. What do we do to meet the challenge? How do we meet that challenge? What does that affect us with when we are to look at social responsibility from energy standpoint, from petrochemical to all the chemical things we use, etc. So moving to step nine, we look at what should we do? Selecting a strategy and developing program objectives. We want to classify a strategy and program objectives, make explicit commitments, and adjust objectives. Now, this, this is kind of critical. When you make explicit commitments, make sure that as you make those explicit commitments, you can actually fulfill them. A lot of organizations, unfortunately, make commitments that are well-intentioned but cannot be fulfilled. So we have to be very careful with regards to what commitments we make and how we go about fulfilling those commitments. You want to then look at how do we implement the program? What do we do to evaluate the impact 
as we put these new programs in place. Then look at how are we doing literally control where we monitor, evaluate, analyze, audit, etc. to look at how well the program's running. And then lastly, to kind of go back into the, the, the circular step, if you will, change what's not working. Go back to step one, start revising and making sure that the program's got some resilience to it, and then it also can be a program whereby you can build uh, on the, for the future. So those 12 steps in conjunction with the nine points I point out here pretty much get us to look at a perspective on corporate social responsibility. And I'll close this with this, kind of this perspective. It's all about what I call targeted flexibility. The ability to be kind of forward thinking and resilient rather than reactive to short term trends and events. Uh, we can argue that the, the core of sustainability and corporate social responsibility is about the resilience of you as an individual, as an organization, and as a social context. So it, this broader aspect of how do we stay resilient in, in terms of this process. Um, I'll close here with my uh, contact information and a little story about a man in the 10,000 pound stone. So, I look at it in this regard with corporate social responsibility and the statement says if you keep doing what you've always done you'll keep getting the same results. Okay? So effectively if you put a 10,000 pound stone above someone's head and drop it the result is generally a heavy consequence for that person having the stone dropped on their head. However if I can break that challenge that 10,000 pound stone into 10,000 pounds of pebbles and drop one pebble at a time on your head, the results will be totally different. You'll be able to be sustainable and resilient because the small pebbles won't have the massive effect of a catastrophic event like the 10,000 pound stone. So with social responsibility, we need to look at social responsibility as being this 10,000 pound stone that needs to be broken down into these small pebbles that are going to be manageable and that we can be flexible with. So I'll close with that and then I'll turn it over to our moderator and she'll talk about ISO 26000 training courses. Mr. Sikish, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I would like to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for ISO 26000 Introduction Foundation Lead Implementer and Lead Auditor courses. Uh, this training is designed to turn uh, ideas into action and provides guidance on how businesses and organizations can operate in a socially responsible way. A PCB certificate will demonstrate your dedication in implementing and managing these processes and frameworks and most importantly you will be recognized worldwide. Uh, for more information, please visit our website, uh, www.pcb.com slash training. Uh, now we'll go ahead and take some time for questions. Uh, Mr. Sikish, the first question is, uh, what kind of negative effects can a company have on the society if they don't uh, corporate social responsibility policy? Well, I think the negative in, in a lot of respects is that they are, are uh, potentially have a reputational issue that they face. Uh, you get branded as a, uh, a, I won't say a renegade, but as a as a organization that doesn't have the needs of the community in uh, interest at hand. So when we look at that, I, some examples that I would think of would be companies that have gone into areas and developed and built plants programs, etc. And then once they're, they find that uh, it's not making the kind of money that they want to make, they shut it down, leave the community at large, and move to the next, ne the next operation. So that has, has negative consequences from a social responsibility standpoint. Uh, look at, if you will, a lot of the energy companies that go out and uh, now are trying to help improve the communities that they're operating in. So in a lot of com countries with natural resource wealth, we're starting to see that companies are taking an active interest in developing things like schools and hospitals and providing more uh, for the people so it helps supplement the government interventions in a lot of areas. And it changes the way that, that these 
organizations are viewed. So if, you, if you're not doing it, you have a tendency to be sort of a pariah in that regard. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is corporate sus sustainability reporting? This is uh, an, an issue that companies are now beginning to address as, as part of what their uh, the annual reporting requirements that they have. So corporate sustainability reporting is essentially uh, a summarization of what's being done to address their corporate social responsibility. So it, it kind of gives you, like an annual report would give you, information on the organization and its initiatives in corporate social responsibility as they occur. So you may have, is, let's say for a, a, a large organization with worldwide operations, they may break this down into several areas of regions where they are active and what they're doing in those regions to help. I think if you look at Coca-Cola as a, as a company, uh, they have some very good corporate social responsibility programs. Yes, they want to sell their product, but they also go into areas and help you know, with water purification and trying to improve the life of the individuals that they're selling their products to. Uh, thank you once again for this presentation, Mr. Sikic. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time and we will answer to all the other questions individually by email. Uh, also, don't forget to check PCB's webinar schedule on our website, pcb.com, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll be updated with our weekly webinars. On behalf of PCB and our presenter, we wish you a great weekend. Bye.